This be revealed. I am Sayyid Subhatali, and you are watching Fall Fans. Al Qaeda's leader Amin al Zawari has been assassinated through a drone strike in the heart of Kabul. Amin al Zawari was one of the major leaders of Al Qaeda who was allegedly responsible for 9 11 attacks. President Joe Biden announced the death of Amin al Zawari through his tweet and also. He demanded Afghanistan of a responsibility and not to become a safe haven for their militants. Uh, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken has reminded Taliban of their commitments that were signed between the two sides back in the year 2020 in the city of Doha, the Qatari capital, wherein Taliban could not house the uh, terrorists that are wanted in the United States. Our team has prepared a package. Watch the package before I bring my first guest to the program. After the hasty withdrawal of US and NATO forces from Afghanistan and the Taliban takeover of power in August 2021, instability and conflict gripped the war-ravaged country. The security of Afghanistan still continues to pose glaring challenge to regional and international stakeholders. In a dramatic development, US President Joe Biden announced that Al-Qaeda leader Amal al-Zawahiri has been killed in a CIA drone strike in Afghanistan's capital, Kabul. Al-Qaeda leader Amal al-Zawahiri, who has been killed in a U.S. drone strike in Afghanistan was the group's key ideologue and strategist. The president said in an evening address from the White House that the U.S. intelligence officials tracked al-Zawahiri to a home in downtown Kabul, where he was hiding out with his family. A Taliban spokesman described the U.S. operation as a clear violation of international principles, but did not mention slain al-Qaeda leader Amal al-Zawahiri. Such actions are a repetition of the failed experiences of the past 20 years and are against the interests of the United States of America, Afghanistan and the region, according to Taliban spokesman. The operation is hailed in global media as a significant counterterrorism win for the Biden administration just 11 months after American troops left the country after a two-decade war. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm joined by two guests in the first uh, round of this program. Uh, my first guest is joining me from United States, Dr. Carl Carlton Teller. He is from University of Akron and an expert of counterterrorism. I welcome you, Dr. Call, to the show. Thank you for having me. And to join me over the phone, I have with me Osama Nizamani. He is researcher at EPRI. Osama, welcome to the program. Uh, thank you so much, Shabbat, for having me on the show. Starting from you, Dr. Call, Call Teller. So what do you think about this major development and how is the sentiment in the United States? So the general sentiment in the United States is that this was a good thing. Uh, most people are aware that Ayman al-Zawahiri was important for al-Qaeda, uh, that he was bin Laden's number two for many, many years. I think he fell off some people's radars um, after the death of bin Laden because al-Qaeda was in the United States. It's, I think a lot of Americans lost track of the threat that was also posed by al-Qaeda. For those people in the policy community in the United States, particularly those who are tasked with American national security, Al-Qaeda was still very much seen as a threat, and Ayman al-Zawahiri was seen as an important actor in the global jihadi scene that was threatening not only to the United States, but all to, also to American interests and to American allies as well. Dr. Kahl, was Al-Qaeda at this point in time really a threat for the United States? Right. So th this is a common conception that people have is that Al Qaeda really uh, was diminished down to no threat to American security at all. And I have to say that, that that's kind of a misconception. And the, the thing I would say is that there have been multiple plots that have been thwarted and sometimes just by luck that were meant to be major plots against the United States with aircraft, with uh, shooting bombs, things like that. There's been major plots against the United States, but also against the United States' interests overseas and our allies as well. So Al-Qaeda remains a threat. And there's three things that I would add really quickly as to why Al-Qaeda may seem like it's not such a threat. One is that the United States has gotten much more serious about its domestic security since 9-11. Our counterterrorism efforts have increased many, many times. Uh, the international effort of the United States to 
defeat Al Qaeda is significant, and I don't need to go into that because I think your viewers know well what the United States has done internationally in relation to that. And the third thing is that Al Qaeda has played it smart in that it's been involved in what we call kind of strategic rebuilding in that they they want to rebuild to the point where they can be strong enough to be a viable group that can really hurt the United States and not go into piecemeal attacks or attract American attention where they can be hunted down. So there was quite a bit of wisdom in that strategy. In the long run, it didn't work out for Ayman al zawahiri because he was found and killed. Coming to you, Osama, how do you think about this development? Do you believe uh, Al-Qaeda was a threat at this point in time for the United States? I think it's important to consider that uh, when the U.S. actually launched its uh, war against uh, terrorism after 9-11, uh, and the very purpose for going into Afghanistan was for the fact that uh, the U.S. was seeking to disrupt and dismantle and uh, destroy any kind of infrastructure that Al-Qaeda had uh, then in Afghanistan. And so we saw that uh, horizontally and to some extent vertically expanding in other parts of the world, including in Africa and also including in Middle East, which also included... Uh, undertaking uh, uh, drone strikes uh, involving decapitation of leadership and also attacking uh, some of the infrastructure of the of the terror network. So uh, in my understanding, uh, while the terror group has not been successful and part of it uh, certainly goes to uh, some of these counter and proactive measures that were, exercised by the United States uh, internationally on that and not just in uh, in in Afghanistan I believe these are perhaps one of the reasons why uh, we saw thankfully the lack of uh, the al-qaeda's ability to launch any attack on the United States and so I think this is this is perhaps uh, uh, the, the 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 very larger context in which we have to see this development. Uh, coming back to you, Dr. Carl, so killing the main leadership of an organization as uh, big as Al-Qaeda, will it produce some results? Does it not become a counterproductive exercise since uh, the organization yeah. that then gets divided into many splinter units, uh, which become more difficult to handle? I, I think actually the, the data show that killing off the top leadership of these groups does matter. And it matters in a positive way in terms of degrading the capabilities of these groups. I'll give you an example, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula was a significant threat to the United States, to Saudi Arabia, to the region. In the late 2000s, there was a concerted American-Saudi effort to degrade Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. And a lot of what was done were drone strikes, and those drone strikes were carried out as leaders, also against the foot soldiers of the group too, so against the leadership. The leadership of that group has been so decimated and incapable of really rebounding that that part of Al-Qaeda has diminished as a threat significantly. So these, these attacks against the leadership, they do matter. Osama, you just heard what Dr. Gall has said. What is your opinion about this further splintering organizations like Al-Qaeda into, into subunits? I think it's, uh, it's always been this debate in, in, in counterterrorism studies, whether decapitation has been successful in terms of ensuring that a threat from that group uh, or any terrorist organization has been eliminated or otherwise. Uh, I think we could cite uh, different case studies in terms of whether uh, this has been successful or not. Uh, even if you look at in in uh, the case of TTP, uh, when different uh, uh, members of the leadership were taken out, uh, you would always see someone filling in uh, the role of the leadership uh, as a successor. Uh, and 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 as a result, uh, those very terror groups were, uh, in some capacity, able to ensure that you know they were they were able to uh, survive uh, as as an organization. However, when the question is concerned, 
you know, if if the decapitation has has led to any successes, I think if we take a look at the example of uh, of of Sri Lanka when uh, you know Sri Lanka was able to not only ensure that the terror group uh, was was eliminated, but it also took out its uh, its leadership, which eventually resulted in the in the complete elimination of uh, threat emanating from that terror groups uh, terror group in particular. Uh, and to and to uh, just uh, you know build this case further. In this case, uh, we've seen that you know while de- decapitations have not been that successful, it pretty much depends on who the next leader always is. While uh, you know one could definitely say that um, uh, you know after the killing of Osama bin Laden, Iman al Zahawi was not able to uh, you know bring back uh, or uh, you know resuscitate Al Qaeda to the level where it was. Uh, initially, uh, but you certainly need to understand that um, uh, you know in 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 this uh, very ecosystem of uh, terror groups, uh, Daesh came up as a more violent, as a more attractive alternative for foot soldiers uh, that saw it as a as a as a as a as a as a viable alternative for undertaking terror related activities. And while you could you could certainly find it as as an evidence uh, validating your question, but I believe you know it it, it has to be it has to be a multi pronged uh, uh, you know uh, uh, endeavor in order to ensure that uh, threats from these groups do not recur in future again. So it's just simply not about making sure that uh, uh, you know. Uh, uh, decapitation is the final and the absolute solution to it. And when we look at in the broader context in Afghanistan's case, I think Taliban certainly has some commitments that it needs to meet in terms of its uh, Doha agreement and the assurances that it gave to, gave to United States and uh, some of these commitments that it has given to the international community also. So uh, I think we will need to as long as Afghanistan is concerned, we will need to look at it in that context also. Now, while there is certainly the decapitation, how uh, successfully would Taliban follow up in terms of ensuring that uh, the the lost ground to Al Qaeda is not uh, given back to to them in a way that helps them uh, find a safe haven in the country? So I think that's that's something important that uh, sort of falls back on. On Taliban, in terms of uh, while there's a decapitation of uh, Iman al Zahavi, uh, you know, the, the group and any successive leadership is unable to find a strong foothold in the country. Coming back to you, Dr. Carl, so United States, despite the fact that does not have any boots on ground, despite the fact that there are no immediate air bases for United States uh, around Afghanistan, it can still take out a target as valuable as Emin Zawahiri. Does it not de-justify such a long uh, presence of US military on Afghan soil and also about the fact that it has become, it, it had remained one of the most expensive and long wars of Afghanistan, of United States? Well, it wasn't a simple task. Uh, it wasn't a simple task to get I Emin mean, Zawahiri either. Uh, it took a lot of intelligence work. It took a lot of planning. Uh, it it took some luck in the sense that he became a bit bold in that he moved into a neighborhood in Kabul where we knew there was leadership of the Taliban. Uh, we, we also were able to discern that he would come out on the balcony of the house where he was staying on a regular basis. So he got sloppy, which made it lucky for us because it was easier to target him. Uh, I can tell you, be, being very aware of the efforts that were taken by the United States to degrade and destroy Al Qaeda in Afghanistan and also in Pakistan and the tribal areas where the group was was pretty heavily ensconced for quite a while, that it took great efforts to find the the leadership and the foot soldiers of Al Qaeda. It was sometimes very difficult, if not impossible, to track these people down. Sometimes it took years to successfully find them. 
Uh, and it was also not an easy thing because there were collateral casualties as well known in Pakistan that, uh, you know, particularly the strikes in the tribal areas, those were not easy to pull off without putting the local people in harm's way. So this was a very, very difficult operation. It, it, it's easy to see that it would have been impossible to do this completely over the horizon in the sense that if we had tried to do this from outside of Afghanistan, from our bases in the Middle East, that it would have been impossible to do it at the scale that we did. And one of the big concerns is that now that the United States does not have a presence in Afghanistan, that Al Qaeda can grow in Afghanistan. And there's no way we can carry up drone strike after drone strike from the Middle East against Al Qaeda foot soldiers in Afghanistan. Problem. This is a significant worry. Dr. Khan, let me, let me, let me take uh, this question to Osama. Osama, after taking out a target as mighty as Amin is Zawahiri, do you think the presence of the United States on the soil of Afghanistan for long 20 years can be justified? Uh, while if you look at it from a normative perspective, uh, that uh, should one country be granted the right to you know, be the judge, jury, and the executioner in this case, then you know it, it certainly makes for a very good normative argument. But on the other hand, if we if we take into consideration some other facts, the fact that you know there are certainly UN resolutions on the table which stipulate it on 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 the international community and member states to assist uh, you know uh, different countries, and that also includes the United States to carry out. Uh, uh, operations with respect to you know uh, counter terror related uh, initiatives that's that's one thing on the other on the other hand i think it's important to bear in mind that you know both taliban and the united states had a had a doha agreement which required taliban to ensure that there is a denial of the afghan soil to any terror groups or individuals uh, of of those very very groups in the first place so i think we have to look at uh, these these actions within the context of this uh, larger purview that we have before ourselves, and then most importantly, uh, you know we we have to understand that a lot of these rogue elements uh, uh, or terror terror groups, they actually you know very much operate outside of um, uh, you know structures of governance or you know uh, structures. Uh, or institutions that are supposed to, uh, you know, deal in a, in a certain mandated way. So since, you know, terror groups feel that they are justified and they feel no inhibition in exercise of violence, then certainly uh, states, uh, be they those in the region or outside the region, and especially a country like United States, which, uh, you know, had a history of a presence in Afghanistan, for eliminating Al Qaeda uh, would would certainly very much be uh, pushed towards uh, you know exercising such initiatives. So I think it's it's very much into the context of the the agreement that has taken place between the Taliban and also the United States uh, in terms of uh, how Taliban would would ensure that you know such groups or individuals uh, you know belonging to to their leadership. Are not able to, uh, you know, use Afghan territory to to undertake their their operations. So I think a way forward would would certainly be towards uh, how the U.S. and Taliban would come to some form of an arrangement in terms of ensuring uh, that compliance or meeting of this uh, this very condition. Doctor Carl, uh, it was again a drone strike, and drone strikes is one of the phenomena that are heavily criticized in this part of the world. As an expert of conflict studies, will you support drone strikes or the use of drones to eliminate high value targets, despite the fact that these drone strikes have been heavily criticized? Um, I typically stay fairly ag agnostic on the issue of whether I favor drone strikes or not. It depends in general where they're carried out and how they're carried out. I will say that there are times and there are places where drone strikes are the only really available option to deal with a significant threat to American national security. 
Uh, I think that some of the drone strikes that were carried out in the tribal areas of Pakistan were carried out on behalf of other parties. Let's just put it that way uh, in kind of a quid pro quo type of thing. Uh, this, the, the, the drone strikes, though, towards the end of the American campaign in particular were aimed at avoiding civilian casualties as much as possible for fear of killing innocent people, also because of the backlash that they would cause, that, that kind of a thing. Osama, taking you back in the conversation, so what is your take? You just heard what Dr. Kala said. What is your take on, on this drone strikes, the elements of drone strikes? Again, I think it's a very valid question, uh, Shabbat. Uh, we have to understand that United States withdrew from Afghanistan almost uh, a year ago now. Uh, and uh, but despite that, uh, you know, despite the fact that U U.S. has uh, removed all of its forces from Afghanistan, we have to understand that within the U.S. Uh, strategic and policymaking circles, there's always been this debate, and especially starting from the times of uh, President Obama, the policy to uh, to you know have a very minimal footprint uh, on ground to undertake counter-terror related uh, initiatives. Uh, you know, uh, the, the very phrase that, you know, no boots on the ground is, 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 is the very uh, essential strategy uh, where, where the use of act drones actually fall in place. And so relying on over the horizon capabilities uh, like drones, especially by state actors, would certainly be one, one uh, of the of of the key instruments towards counter ter terror related operations. The reason being a because you know they are they're very cost effective. No state has to actually uh, employ uh, cost in terms of both uh, blood and treasure. Although there there certainly is treasure uh, you know invested when 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 a drone platform is being uh, uh, deployed. But however you know it's not something. Uh, equivalent uh, to you know placing humans or foot soldiers on the ground, and I think it it also uh, uh, also you know sort of takes away uh, the cost that may come from reprisals uh, for the state itself. So it makes it very easier for states to employ drones in order to uh, take out uh, uh, you know threats uh, emanating even from uh, terror groups. And if we look at uh, last uh, last one decade, you know, drones as a weapon based platform, they've actually evolved in terms of their roles and they're now being used by multiple uh, actors, uh, even uh, ranging from conventional to asymmetric and even for uh, launching terror attacks. But as long as counter terror related uh, operations are concerned, I see drones uh, would still be relied upon as a uh, as a reliable instrument uh, under the no boots ground or over the horizon, uh, as long as the other uh, aspect that the overall over the horizon capability is concerned. All right, Osama. Osama, let me take uh, Dr. Carl back into the conversation. Dr. Carl, my last question, timing of the attack, many people believe have been carefully chosen to accomplish political objectives. Uh, United States government is under heavy criticism because of the financial meltdown because of the economic quagmire that the United States is stuck or sucked into at the moment. How do you comment on it? So whenever there's a high profile attack of any type, immediately you hear, oh, this was politically motivated. Uh, since I was young and following uh, American politics and American strategic actions around the world, I can't think of one time where a president made a big decision about American national security, uh, you know, to, to attack a target or make some kind of decision about an intervention of some sort where people have uh, not said, oh, that was politically motivated. I honestly don't think this was politically motivated. Uh, the, the intelligence is what drove this, if you think about it. It's, they had Ayman al-Zawahiri in a place. They knew what his pattern was. He appeared on the balcony uh, and they made the decision to go after him. Uh, it very well could have been the case that he would have moved at some point 
uh, been aware that, that the drones were overhead. The type of drone that they used is not one that flies super, super high. It could have been seen uh, or heard from, from the street. And so this was a decision that, that had a, a, a timeliness to it where the president had to make the call, we, we, we get him now or we potentially lose him. And that's happened in the past with uh, Al Qaeda targets where they, they had the target in sight, but there was a delay in the political decision making and then they lost that target. That was the case with been seen several times in the late 1990s and because of slow decision making he was able to get away thank you very much ladies and gentlemen we'll take a break and we'll join you back with the second segment of the program stay with us Welcome back. Ladies and gentlemen, the war between Russia and Ukraine has become a flashpoint for the entire world. And this war has had consequences on almost every country on planet Earth. Be it developed economies like China and the United States, they have taken the brunt of this war. And in case of economies of developing countries, the case has been much worse. And the worst example is of Sri Lanka a country dropping down to a state of financial collapse just because of uh, the problems that started from the war between Russia and Ukraine. Now, one important factor is the food crisis coming out of Ukraine because Ukraine is one of the countries that grow maximum wheat, corn, sunflower oil, and not only fulfills its own need, but also is a major exporter of these food grains to the rest of the world. Recently, President Recep Tayyip Erdogan of Turkey has arbitrated a deal between Russia and Ukraine, a maneuver that no other European country could successfully pull off. This actually allows Ukraine to export grain to many countries starting from Lebanon. And Turkey would stay to be the center point of this agreement. Our team has prepared a package. Watch the package before I bring my first guest to this part of my program. Ukraine crisis has exacerbated global challenges as flood inflation has soared across much of the developing world and has trapped several richer countries in a cycle of rising prices. A report by World Bank has found that war in Eastern Europe would hit many countries with an increase in food bills worth more than 1% of their annual national income, while others would fail to contain the impact and be plunged into a full-blown debt crisis. Exhibiting a stunning diplomatic breakthrough, Turkey announced that a deal has been reached with Russia to allow Ukraine to resume exports of grains through the Black Sea. The first ship to depart Odessa under a landmark grain deal is continuing its journey towards Istanbul, where it will be inspected before heading to Lebanon. Ukrainian presidential advisor said that about 22,000 Russian troops are preparing to advance on the major cities. The U.S. announced a new tranche of weapons for Ukraine's forces worth $550 million, including ammunition for rocket launchers and artillery guns. Russia has accused the United States of direct involvement in the Ukraine war, highlighting the way Kiev used US-supplied long-range HIMARS rocket launch systems. In a letter to the participants of a conference on the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, Russian President Vladimir Putin warned that there could be no winners in a nuclear war and no such war should ever be started. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. And my first guest in this segment is Mr. Samad Zia. He is Senior Research Fellow of Army Institute of Military History, joining me over Skype. Samad, I welcome you to the program. Samad, before we talk about this specific deal, can you update us on what exactly is happening in Ukraine? Well, we can see that the conflict in Ukraine uh, does not seem to be coming to an end. Uh, this is... Uh, nothing new uh, uh, obviously there are expectations at some point because that because of uh, the sanctions on Russia the advances in Ukraine would come to a halt uh, a natural halt that uh, such economic sanctions would somehow pave way for discussions for bilateral dialogue for trilateral or even uh, a group based dialogue so as to uh, address the concerns of uh, Russia as well as Ukraine and as, as well as look at the apprehensions that the West have as a way 
uh, the advances of uh, Russia in its neighborhood. Uh, we, we, we can see and very clearly at that that Russia is in no mood to back off. Uh, this is clear as the day. Um, the shelling in Turetsk, north of uh, Donetsk. Uh, we, we've seen that happening. Uh, we've seen how uh, the Russian forces have advanced into, they have gone into uh, Zephyrizia, which is uh, a town where there's a nuclear power plant. Uh, obviously, the Ukrainian scientists and the personnel are working there, and they're the ones taking care of the nuclear power plant, but ultimately, naturally, because it needs uh, a, a full-on maintenance program. It needs a lot of repair work. That's uh, the nature of nuclear power plants. Um, and obviously, because there's a conflict, there's a war uh, going on in this region, that is not particularly possible at this point. Uh, moreover, Ukraine does not want the IAEA under the auspices of the United Nations to legitimize the, uh, the, the role of Russia or the presence of Russia in this region. Um, uh, uh, but ultimately, they'll have to succumb to the idea of uh, allowing uh, the UN for, uh, UN inspectors uh, for allowing um, uh, some sort of repair work and maintenance because uh, some three decades back, uh, Ukraine was the uh, was the area uh, where uh, Chernobyl took place, um, and they are well cognizant of the fact that uh, they have to. Take, uh, they have to work towards resolving this uh, issue at least. The inspectors will have to come in, the repair work, work will have to be done. Seven, many believe uh, Russia is waiting for her historic weapon, a weapon that has won many wars for Russia in the past, and that is harsh winters of Russia. This time, Russia is also aiming to put some gas sanctions further on Europe. How would you agree with me on that? Shavasab, I think uh, this can be addressed by looking at uh, some numbers. Uh, we need to ascertain how much exactly does, how much gas does uh, uh, the EU actually import from Russia. So if you look at the figures from 20, uh, 20 to 2021, uh, the EU imported somewhat uh, the figure of 140 billion cubic meters of gas. Um, and in addition to this, they imported about 15 billion cubic meters of liquefied natural gas, which is LNG, from Russia. Uh, there's a 10-point agenda that they're working on, uh, the EU is working on, and they're trying to reduce this consumption, uh, and they're trying to bring it down uh, to 50 billion cubic meters eventually, uh, within, within one year, that is. Uh, at this point, about... 45% uh, of EU's uh, gas imports are from uh, from Russia and about 40% of the consumption of uh, gas is also coming uh, from Russia. So this these numbers, they actually help explain and uh, extrapolate their behaviors as well as to whether the EU is really delinked and how much reliant they are on Russian uh, gas supplies. Russia has this, uh, this this trump card in its hand. We saw what happened in Finland, and uh, uh, if we just look at some figures, they actually help explain uh, the behavior of uh, these countries as well. For instance, Germany just alone it imports about forty two point six percent of its uh, it, its uh, its gas from from Russia. Similarly, Italy and uh, countries like Hungary and uh, Netherlands, about 11.6 and 15.7% of their gas imports come from Russia. And these are massive numbers. They, uh, they have to play smartly. They have to be a little more shrewd. And they have to think about how exactly are they going to handle Russia. Seba, don't you think that the cost of this war has risen phenomenally for Europe? It is just getting out of proportion or out of equation. For Europe to manage this any further. Do you see any, any chance of solving this diplomatically by the European diplomacy? Honestly, um, if, if you just look at the uh, recent trends, uh, the way Europe and the US, the way they have uh, been looking to create hysteria, and they have actually created hysteria about the Russian, uh, you know, bear coming to invade their countries and uh, these countries in the north, the Scandinavian countries, in the Finland and uh, Sweden, they're now 
looking to join and the, uh, and resolutions have been passed in Italy and the US Congress as well uh, so as to allow them to become a part of NATO there's a massive hysteria um, and this shows us that Europe is uh, unable to grasp the uh, the difficulty that it's going to face in the future uh, they, they they're not coming towards the kind of dialogue that they really should be working towards um, there is always talk of laying down more sanctions on Russia. Countries uh, which are most affected even now, they under the pressure of the US uh, as a part of NATO, they, they're just complying with uh, the, the demands of the US. And obviously they have their own agendas as well. I wouldn't quite say that they are working as puppets or they're working as, you know, uh, just an extension of the US policy. but. Uh, ultimately, they uh, any diplomatic solution that they should have worked towards, um, it's it's not really being uh, it's it's not really been uh, not much has been done on that. Uh, at this point, it's very important that countries like Germany and France and the United Kingdom, and if there are any major other major players in uh, in in EU, uh, are not even EU, just Europe, uh, they should come forward. They should. Uh, look for solutions. Um, I think at some point these countries will have to sit down and try to create uh, some sort of a framework where the security of one country is not necessarily working towards the insecurity of another country because it's because of this security insecurity or uh, you know this uh, this paradox, uh, this hysteria, this uh, endless uh, talk of invasion of Europe by Russia or uh, the way NATO is sitting at the gates of creeping into the space, the, you know, the, the, the uh, space of um, the safe space of Russia. Um, they'll have to work out a deal. They'll have to work towards a solution to resolve this issue. Right, Simon, but still recently Italian parliament has endorsed the inclusion of uh, Sweden and Finland into NATO something that is going to aggravate the problem between Russia and uh, Europe further. How do you comment on this? So we saw on the 3rd of August um, that uh, Italy's uh, parliament uh, ratified um, the accession of Finland and uh, Sweden to NATO. Um, this is a huge development, but um, it's a step uh, which is taken by, which has been taken by Italy and the U.S., and it will need to be ratified by the other 28 members of NATO as well. Um, obviously, this is creating this, uh, uh, this sense of insecurity in Europe, and there is this feeling that, given the right circumstances and given the right opportunity, um, Russia would be willing and more than happy to invade these smaller countries which do not have a substantial or a proper army per se uh, um, and as we all know uh, NATO laws say that uh, an attack on one country by an aggressor uh, will be considered an attack on all the countries so this way they feel that their interests their sovereignty their territory uh, all of these uh, uh, essential part of their, uh, of their of their countries uh, of the being would be protected uh, by joining NATO. Um, on the one hand, uh, it can be seen as uh, a right sort of a step for them uh, in a way that they're trying to protect themselves. Um, in the long run, this is just detrimental to the essence of uh, of Europe. There is this new sense of a war erupting in Europe, uh, the, the concept of Europe being a safe space, uh, of a safe place, it's eroding now. Uh, the conflict has somewhat stayed within Ukraine, however, uh, its waves can be felt all over, uh, even to island nations such as, um, uh, as the United Kingdom. Um, so ultimately, um, Russia will also have to think that it's scaring away its its next door neighbors, its uh, the the countries that it conducts trade with, uh, the countries it has 
good economic and energy ties with and is letting Ukraine becoming a part of NATO or not letting it become a part of NATO uh, was that really is that really a choice that Russia needs to intervene uh, in uh, it has scared away more countries than uh, it has kept away from NATO Ladies and gentlemen, from Istanbul, I am now joined by Dr. Bilal Begis, who is an economist and an expert of Turkey's economic affairs. Dr. Bilal, I welcome you to the program. Thank you, Siad. Thanks for having me. Uh, Dr. Bilal, Turkey is given a lot of credit by the rest of the world. Many critics are saying uh, that the deal between Russia and Ukraine uh, is not only something as an extraordinary diplomatic achievement, by Turkey, but also going to help Turkey to increase her political and diplomatic influence as well. How do you think of it? The global food crisis, security, hunger risk, and the importance of grain uh, export deal, they have been the most remarkable development of at least the past uh, few weeks. The deal is surely a huge diplomatic success, a political and strategic victory for Turkey and the world, a critical step forward to ensure global food security. The world is, as we know, facing an international food crisis, and the world economy will breathe from this new Black Sea Green Export Corridor. Billions of people around the world they are affected by the recent hunger risk from Africa to Middle East uh, to South Asia. The Grain Export Agreement signed under the Turkish and the UN Safeguard, it will help resume the shipment from Ukraine to the rest of the world. And despite all the low trust on both sides, actually, Turkey as a trusted mediator, it has helped reach a final agreement uh, here. And the grain ships departure, sailing on the route and their ins inspection at the harbors, it will all be organized by the Joint Committee at the JCC Center in Istanbul. Uh, it's an another diplomatic success, I would say. The JCC Center is expected to monitor all the grain shipment process, actually. Dr. Bilal, I remember we had a very detailed discussion in this program regarding the economic turmoil of Turkey. So connect to, in order to connect your conversation with, with our previous program on Turkey's economy, don't you think that Turkey that is in a very bad economic shape at the moment or is in a very challenging uh, e economic turmoil at the moment will greatly get helped out because of being a center point for all the Russian food trade or all the Ukrainian food trade uh, going to the rest of the world. Russia and Ukraine, they are both among the leading Turkish trade partners. So end of this war and a new peace process, it is important for the Turkish economy as well. Food prices is a critical factor in the Turkish inflation figures, for example. And besides the war in Ukraine is increasing food, energy, fertilizer, pesticide prices and supply chain issues uh, that are related to Black Sea supply chain and grain corridor is increasing insurance and logistic costs for all type of exports, uh, from agricultural products to energy prices, food and commodity prices, it's all a huge issue. And blockade of the Ukrainian Black Sea ports and Black Sea grain corridor is leading to decreased grain supply, intensified global food crisis, Increase relative prices in general, uh, fertilizers from Russia and cooking oil mainly from uh, Ukraine, their prices had, in, has increased at unprecedented rates so far. Bread and pasta prices are increasing, potential new waves of migration from Middle East, Africa and Central Asia is another huge issue. And this grain export deal it is expected to help ease the global food crisis, for example, is food shortages all around the world, decrease food and grain prices in general, and help empty the already full grain silos in Ukraine, for example. It will encourage Ukrainians to sow seeds for the next season, decrease insurance and transportation costs. So the production losses due to heat waves, droughts, they will all be replaced this way. Food inflation will be limited and taken under control.
Dr. Bilal, as uh, you're aware, the food commodities have got expensive everywhere in the world and there are countries that do not grow enough of their food productions. The situation is more dire in many of such countries. Lebanon, which is the recipient of the first cargo, is one of these countries. Uh, and there are many other African countries that are also looking for food supplies to be resumed from Ukraine. Uh, do, don't you think that this is going to be an important deal to sort out this food crisis as well to a great extent, if not at all, if not completely? Russia and Ukraine, they are two major global wheat suppliers uh, for the starter. Russia and Ukraine, they produce almost a third of global wheat supply, um, including the production and also the export. Uh, for example, according to the 2020 UN FAO data, Ukraine supplies 92% uh, of wheat Im imports of Moldova, 81% of wheat imports to Lebanon, 64% to Qatar, almost 50% of Tunisia, Libya, and uh, Pakistan, your countries. And Ukraine and Russia together, uh, they account for more than 50% of many North African and Middle Eastern countries. So uh, it is very, very important for imports of uh, these type of uh, uh, countries close to the equator. Food and energy security, they are the two most critical issues the world is facing today. In particular, the Russia-Ukraine war that started on February 24, it has worsened the global food crisis and hence became the recent, uh, Hence came the recent uh, grain export agreement that we're talking about now. In particular, the grain and food shortages they are expected to affect neighboring Middle Eastern and North African economies much more. Food insecurity, it is also expected to trigger new waves of migration towards Turkey and Europe. And it is therefore, in the meantime, a security issue. And the grain export deal, it is a sign of growing strategic and political importance of uh, and the power of Turkey. Uh, it is also a sign of increasing importance of the Black Sea Grain Corridor that we are talking about today. And it's a sign of significant share of Russia and Ukraine in global grain and food market and its potential contributions to mitigate the global food crisis and food security. So, uh, well, we need to understand the global food crisis very well. The international organizations such as the World Bank, IMF, FAO, they all consider the current food crisis and commodity crisis in general as a critical issue that needs to be taken very seriously. The ongoing food crisis is expected to go on for at least another year. It's another critical issue to take into account. And food is already a strategic issue in the overly populated and inequality prone 21st century. Thank you very much for uh, Dr. Bilal Vegas for being guest in my program. Thanks for having us yet. Ladies and gentlemen, as the war between Ukraine and Russia continues, the diplomacy has taken a major leap. Let us pray and hope that the diplomacy takes an, another major leap to sort out this crisis altogether. We'll join you next week with another program. And until then, Allah Hafiz.